OK. So let's start talking about some science. OK, the scientific method is fundamental to what we do in biology. OK? And we always start with something that's intriguing, something that's interesting. It's an observation of some sort. Then we get curious about it. We start asking questions about it. So we form a hypothesis. OK? It's just a hypothesis. I got an idea. I think it might be this. Well, let's test your hypothesis. You got an idea of what's going on? Test it. Well, you can test it through some sort of experiment. Or in biology, you do a lot of comparisons. We will compare different species. We'll compare different phenomena and try to come up with some explanation for the pattern. From our tests, of these hypotheses, we then draw conclusions and say, well, I had this nutty idea and, you know, I tested it, and boy, was I wrong. So I got to think again. Then we might go back and form another hypothesis and we go through the same thing over and over and over again. We're refining our hypothesis. We want to get closer and closer to an understanding of what causes this phenomenon. After we refined our hypothesis, we begin to gain confidence in our understanding of what's going on, and we make a generalization. That generalization is really the building block of our science. We generally know this to be going on in this way. Now we can make various assumptions about reality. Okay? So, I want to give a concrete and frivolous, silly example of the use of the scientific method just to get us started. Animals have tails. I wonder why animals have tails. This cheetah has a tail. It's a long tail. And that tail kind of moves around in certain ways as the cheetah runs along. What's that all about? So we form a hypothesis. Somehow it helps them when they move around. Okay? In the case of the cheetah, if you watch a cheetah running along, it will bend its tail just as it's about to change direction when it's chasing its prey. It helps change its center of gravity, its momentum, and it can follow the zigzag pattern of an escaping prey animal. That's a pretty good use for a tail. And there are a number of species where their tails clearly do have an excellent use for helping them move around. Like a giant river otter can wag its tail like an, like an oar. Spider monkeys can use it like a fifth leg. So can possums to hang on. Okay? It helps them to move from branch to branch in trees. So let's test our hypothesis. We think a tail is so important, we could do an experiment, right? We could do an experiment. We could chop off the tails, right? Like the butcher's wife. See? And we could ask, will this cheetah be as effective as catching its prey once it's lost its tail compared to another cheetah that still has a full long tail? Okay? And this is not a real experiment. This is just plain. So we can also allow for natural experiments. For several months every year, I'm able to go to Africa, and I have a long-term research program in the Serengeti, where I've been studying African lions for many, many years. And in our lion population, these are animals that have tails, and the lions kind of fiddle around with each other's tails a little bit, and sometimes the tail gets broken. Sometimes they lose the tip of their tail. Okay? And so we've been studying these animals long enough that we can ask, well, if an animal has lost part of its tail or broke its tail, will that have an influence on its survival? 
Okay? Does it serve some useful function? If so, those animals that lost their tails or damaged their tails, maybe they don't live as long as others. Okay? And in fact, if we do look at that, we find that lions with damaged tails suffer about almost 10% higher mortality each year. So having a tail really is pretty useful for a lion because if its tail is broken or otherwise really seriously damaged, they're much more likely to die each year. So tails are important, that's for sure. Now we can also do comparisons. We can look across different species, and some have tails and some don't. Okay. Here are two animals that are both called by their popular names as pandas. There's a giant panda, doesn't have a tail. Red panda does have a tail. Well, it turns out that these animals that don't have tails tend to live quite differently than those that do. The red panda is up a tree. Possums are up trees, spider monkeys are up trees. They all have useful tails. Okay? Pandas are large, they're slow moving, and they never leave the ground. So pandas are staying on the ground. They might not need to have something that assists them in their movements. Whereas those that climb trees, you could fall. You need to be very precise in how you navigate along the skinny branches of a tall tree. So from these experiments, from these comparisons, we want to draw conclusions. So a simple conclusion is that, well, yeah, tails improve balance. Those that need to be up in trees, those that need to run really fast and change directions quickly, having a tail really helps them to maintain their balance so they don't fall or they don't miss their prey. Now from this, then we can refine our hypothesis. And from this, then, we come up with what's called a theory. A theory is a generalization of a lot of tested hypotheses where a lot of data have been collected, a lot of observations have been made, gone back to retest, to refine them further and further and further until you get pretty comfortable with the generalized notion of how life really works. That's the scientific use of the word theory. That's a generalization about these phenomena that you're interested in. So we could say, as a generalization, that if you look at the size and shape of an animal's tail, it will tell you something about its lifestyle. So if we were to see a mountain gorilla for the very first time, and we say, oh, no tail, we'd say, well, that animal must never climb trees. Okay? That's not a profound observation. And most people don't do the scientific method on these kinds of silly little uh, ideas like why they have tails. But I hope you get the point that you start out simple. You test a simple idea. You keep coming back to it to get a more plausible explanation for what's going on, supported by data, supported by real experiments, by real observations, to come up with these kinds of generalizations. Okay. So this is a class in biology. It's not just any field of science, it is biology. We specifically are interested in the study of life. We are going to cover the entire history, the beginning of life, as well as all living things. This is a vast survey course. We're going to cover billions of years of history, as well as millions of species that are alive today. For a lot of people, biology has been controversial. Physics generally contents itself with things that can be picked up and measured. Our fundamental principles in biology are only revealed through processes that that 
take a long time to take place. Evolution is a very slow process. Ecological change is a slow and gradual process. Okay? These can be very controversial. Politicians can misuse these kinds of slow changes. And we want to be very careful in understanding how these processes nevertheless can be strongly understood by considering things over a long time span. Okay? And in particular, there's been a, a, a remarkable resistance to the acceptance of evolution in popular culture in this country. And I think the primary problem is that these are things that have happened so long ago that nobody can go online and get the YouTube video that shows all those first forms of life gradually changing, gradually becoming more complicated. Okay? Nobody saw it. There's no observational record. We have to rely on inference. We have to interpret the evidence that are available today as to what happened in the deep distant past. How do we manage to do that? Can we use the scientific method to form hypotheses about events that cannot be directly observed? And you can't just see on YouTube. Okay? So what I want to do now is again be somewhat frivolous, but to use a frivolous framework to introduce you to some fairly serious concepts. And I want to review a number of creation stories that have been handed down by traditional cultures that have to do with the origins of life. People have always wanted to explain where they came from. We're always interested in about our parents, our grandparents, sometime in the past. How did things get to be the way they are now? What were they like long ago? And most traditional stories have a creation. Most traditional cultures have an origin story that goes all the way back to the beginning of their perception of time. Okay? So what I want to do, again, frivolously, but with some serious intent, is to treat a series of these creation stories as a testable hypothesis. Okay? Let's start with what I'll call hypothesis number one. According to the Pata of the Santal tribe of Bihar in West Bengal in South Asia, the earth rests on the back of a giant tortoise. This is fundamental to their worldview of how earth came to existence, is that it rests on the back of a giant tortoise. Well, it's a testable hypothesis. We did send people out into space. We spent spacecraft to Moon and Mars. People have taken pictures. And if you look back at the Earth from space, there it is. There's no tortoise. Okay? So we reject that hypothesis. We have the creation story that's in the Old Testament. It's illustrated by Michelangelo's Creation of Man in the Sistine Chapel. We can have a very careful hypothesis that derives from the words in Genesis in the Old Testament. And a British clergyman very carefully calculated according to Genesis that if that was literally true, that the universe must have been created on October the 3rd 4004 B.C., okay? And according to Genesis, all life began in the first days of creation, okay? 4004 B.C., that's the part we want to get at first. If you go outside and you know where you're looking in the night sky, with the right kind of telescope, you can see the Andromeda Galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy contains millions of stars, way, way off in space. Its distance can be accurately calculated, 
And we know that it's about 2.9 million light years from Earth. The fact that the Andromeda galaxy is visible to us here today means that the universe is far older than 6,016 years. Much, much older than 6,000 years. If we look even further, deep into space, astronomers have been able to detect what they call the cosmic background emission. And a satellite called the Cosmic Background Emission Explorer has mapped the sky to its farthest depths and can see objects way, way further away than the Andromeda galaxy, a thousand times further away than the Andromeda galaxy. Everything that astrophysics tells us says that the size, the motion, and energy of stars, quasars, and black holes indicate the universe began 13.7 billion years ago. That's a billion years. Okay? That means the universe is a million times older than calculated by our British clergymen in the 19th century. The universe is vast. This particular galaxy, Omega Centauri, contains 10 million stars, 10 million stars, that are 10 to 12 billion years old. Okay? The universe is really, really, really old, a million times older than most interpretations of Genesis. The Earth itself can be estimated to have formed about four and a half billion years ago. The oldest fossils on Earth date from about 3.4 billion years ago. These were living algae three and a half billion years ago. Life did not begin all at once. That's the other part of the Genesis story. Some species appeared far, far earlier than others in the order of billions of years earlier. The Grand Canyon, if we now look at geology instead of astronomy, is a fantastic cross-section of deep history on the Earth. Different layers of rock have different ages. The deeper down you go, the older the rocks are. Down at the bottom, there are granites that are nearly 2 billion years old. Then we're up to about 500 million years and so on. The top of the Kaibab Plateau, the highest level of the Grand, Grand Canyon, those are very old as well. Those rocks are 250 million years ago. The dinosaurs hadn't even appeared before any of those rocks were laid down in the, in the Grand Canyon. The Earth is really, really, really old. Life was here for billions of years before the dinosaurs appeared, 240 million years ago. And they're dinosaurs. So we see those in rock formations that are younger than anything in the Grand Canyon. These very large animals were around for 180 million years. They grew fantastic size, shape, and form those that flew, those that swam in the water, those that ran like hell, and those that were just big and clumsy and hungry. We don't see human, really recognizably human, fossils until we get much, much closer to the present. Some of the oldest clear hominids are about 7 million years ago, not 6,000, Seven million, a thousand times older than the story in Genesis. There are lots of different species. We'll see a lot of fossil hominids later on in the course. There's been a proliferation of these hominid species from about seven million years ago until just recently when we finally became the only hominid on the planet. It was a long time where we shared the earth with other species of hominids, but no longer. The age of the mammals, 
absurdly big mammals about two million years ago. This is the largest mammal that ever lived. It's a fossil rhino. It was 18 feet high to the shoulder. It would have a hard time standing up in here. That's huge. Saber-toothed cats with canine teeth a foot and a half long. Fossil eight, nine feet tall. That's before the NBA. A fossil armadillo the size of a Volkswagen. Fossil horses the size of a rabbit. Okay? In the relatively recent history of the Earth, that is the last 10 million years or so, our own phylogenetic, our own evolutionary lineage, the mammals, had extraordinary diversity and huge sized animals, again, that we don't see around anymore. And in our own lineage, we've seen extraordinary change from the earliest humanoids with very small brains to our current vast domed head. Our recognizably modern species appeared about 100,000 years ago. Again, far, far older than Genesis. Okay, now let's move on to another major creation story, hypothesis number three. This is from the Hindus. According to Hindu mythology, Brahma created the universe, Vishnu protects the universe, but Shiva comes every 10 million years and destroys everything. Shiva the destroyer, and everything must start over. Okay? Now, there have been extraordinary cataclysmic events on the Earth that we know about. There was a meteor impact near the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico that was followed by intense volcanic activity in India that killed off the dinosaurs. That's why they disappeared 65 million years ago. So who? This was a meteor about the size of Manhattan landing in Mexico, boom, creating kind of a nuclear winter. There may have been such, so much geological perturbations, that vast volcanic activities on the opposite side of the Earth in India, huge amounts of volcanic lava and ash was spewed out. Between those two, the climate was unlivable for those large dinosaurs, and they all died. All the big ones died. It's 65 million years ago. Shiva the Destroyer? Well, we do know that there have been periods in our history of life where the number of species, which is indicated by the width of this upside-down Christmas tree-looking thing, so you had relatively species that proliferated, then boom, a catastrophe, they went down, proliferated, boom, went down, diversified again, boom, nearly went gone, boom, boom, okay? Here's the one with the dinosaurs. Lost a lot of species, okay? That's where they went. But there were always survivors, okay? At least some species survived. So the Shiva myth isn't true either. The earth has not been destroyed completely. These are not every 10 million years. They're more irregular than that. And they're not complete. Life today descends as an unbroken chain from the earliest life forms from billions of years ago. Okay? Even in the worst catastrophe, which is about 240 million years ago, where 80% of all living things were lost, well, 20% still survived, and they, they served as the seed stock for all resultant life. Another catastrophe, but the survivors served as the founders for the next huge period of time of diversification and so on. Okay, let's move on to hypothesis number four. Nordic myth. According to Nordic myth, Odin created man 
from the universal ash tree. Okay? It's kind of cute. Odin was bored. Odin and, and Brahma, they, they created people because they were bored. They wanted something to do. And so Odin was bored, so he created man from the universal ash tree. Now, if this hypothesis is correct, our closest living relatives should be trees. Okay? If we strictly believe in Odin, then, okay, our closest relatives must be trees. Well, no. If you actually look at who our closest living relatives are, as we'll see later in the course, we are primates. We're not plants. And we have clear evolutionary linkages to all kinds of monkeys and apes, then to most closely to chimpanzees. Okay? Our closest living relatives are chimps and the other great apes, but extremely close to chimps. However, however, all life descends from those first living things from billions of years ago. And we now have the tools to be able to measure the extent to which we are or are not related to other organisms. As we'll see in the coming weeks, we can find our place on the true tree of life. And if you go back deep enough, you'll see that here's humans and chimpanzees up here are linked to other mammals, so those rodents, then birds, worms, flies, all the way down to the plants. So we are related to trees. Yes, we are. But after a very, very long time, at least a billion years of evolutionary diversification, they're not our closest living relatives, but they're nevertheless share a common ancestor if you go deep enough back into the evolutionary history of life. If we look at the precise similarities and differences between different organisms on this tree of life, you'll see that here we are, the animals. Humans are this tiny little branch over here. We link to the plants. These are all the multicellular organisms over here. Then we still attach, and we're still related, at a far, far more distant way, of course, to a certain branch of bacteria, which is in turn related to another distant branch of bacteria. Okay? So the differences between plants and animals from a biochemical level, although we look hugely different from a tree, and we behave an awful lot different from a, from a plant, we're much more similar to plants than we are to the bacteria. And the way we know this is we have the most precise record of evolutionary history possible. And that is the mode of inheritance. It's our DNA. As more and more sequences of DNA are cataloged and organized in this tree of life, we see the true universality of all living things. It really is true that there is one tree of life and we're just one small branch on that whole huge tree. So, life on Earth. I went through that to introduce you to a few ideas. First is that the universe is really old. There's no doubt about it. All the evidence shows that the, Earth, that the universe is on the order of 13 and a half to 14 billion years old. As time goes on in this course and in your careers, as you move on through life, you may hear people coming up with new estimates for the age of the universe, but they're just tinkering around with a number that's going to stay in the tens of billions of years. Okay? The universe is about 13 and a half to 14 billion years ago. Someday this estimate may go out to more decimal points, but that's good enough for our purposes. It's really, really, really old. The Earth is about 4 billion years. Again, it's really old. Life began about 3.5 billion years ago. 
Again, these numbers may change plus or minus 100 million years or so, but the big picture is very firm. It's at least three and a half million years ago. A long, 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 long time ago.
The last point on this slide is to tell you that we are also 100% sure not only that the Earth is very old in the order of billions of years of age, and that life has also been around for billions of years, we know that all living species share a common ancestry. Okay? All living species on Earth share a common ancestry. So these are the key points I wanted you to get from that little uh, entertaining world tour of creation stories. Okay?